Champagne. Sì, champagne. Sì, champagne. Sì, champagne. Molto bene. Sì. Spero che l'arbitro del Ricardo spanisca prima di stasera. Spero che sì, su. Why can one never go to the first night of a Pirandello play without there being a fight? Let's just hope no one gets hurt. It's a fine state of affairs, though. I mean, when you come to other people's plays, you can make yourself comfortable and accept the illusion that the stage creates for you. That is, if it manages to create one at all. <laughs> <laughs> But when you come to a Pirandello play, you have to hang on to the arms of your seats with both hands, put your head down, ready to butt back everything the writer tries to shove at you. I mean, you, you hear a word, take any word. Uh, take chair, for instance. Oh, my God, did you hear that? He said, chair. <laughs> I'm not going to let him get away with that. Who knows what might be under the chair? Yes, it could be anything, everything. Except that is for a bit of poetry. Exactly, and what we want is poetry. Look, if you want poetry, why don't you look for it under somebody else's chair? Oh. We've had enough of this spasmodic nihilism. And the pleasure he gets from denying things. Being negative just isn't constructive. Mm, bene, bene. <laughs> Burn me. And as soon as my body has been burnt, the ashes must be thrown to the winds. For I want nothing, not even my ashes to remain. But if this cannot be done, the funeral urn must be taken to Sicily and walled into some rough stone near Agrigento, where I was born. In this addition to his will, Luigi Pirandello resigned himself to a place in history. With the understanding of human nature which characterizes his work, He realized that as Italy's leading playwright, his last remains would not be allowed to vanish without a trace as he wished. So they lie where Pirandello was born, within the few square kilometers of Sicily, between Agrigento and the sea, at one of the southernmost points in Europe. The area was first colonized by the Greeks with their temples and amphitheaters in 800 BC, and it's still known by its Greek name, Kaos, or chaos. Perandello was literally, as he proudly claimed, a son of chaos, an appropriate title for a writer whose work contains all the shifting uncertainty, anxieties and formlessness of modern existence. Perandello brought his arts theatre to London in 1925, at the beginning of what was to be a triumphant world tour. At 58, he'd lived more of his life in the 19th century than the 20th, but he'd just reached the high point of his career. The previous five years had seen the controversial opening of plays like Six Characters in Search of an Author and Henry IV, plays in which Pirandello's originality finally burst through to an international audience, which was now ready to recognize a new and unmistakable 20th century voice. Quiet, please, the producer's here. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I can't see a thing here. Could we have some lights? Workers, please. Oh. Oh, no, too early. What is the point of four generations of light in one lifetime, eh? Yes, four. I was born by oil lamp, I grew up with paraffin, I studied by gaslight, and I've always written by electric. It's too many, hurts the eyes, and I'm quite sure it can harm the mind. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it can, you know. Good, right. Let's get started. The House of Leone Gala, a peculiar room, both dining room and study. On stage are Leone Gala, Guido, Venanzi, and Philip, who is known as Socrates. When the curtain rises, Leone Gala, in a cook's hat and apron, is beating an egg in a dish with a wooden spoon. Philip is beating another, and he is dressed as a cook, too. Guido Venanzi is sitting listening. Right. Now, remember in the first act, Leone has explained to his wife's lover, Guido, that cooking helps him keep his balance in what he calls the game of life. Now, you must keep up the pace in this scene at all costs. Give that to me. Yes, my dear Venanzi, he's so rude to me. Sometimes I wonder why I put up with him. Don't talk so much and carry on beating that egg. You see, Venanzi, anyone would think that he was the master and I was a servant, but he amuses me. You see, Philip is my tame devil. I wish the devil would fly away with you. Now, you see, he's swearing. I can hardly talk to him. No need to talk. 
Just shut up. <laughs> really, Socrates? Now, don't you start calling me Socrates. To hell with Socrates. I've had enough of it from the master. I don't even know who he is. What, you don't know him? No, senor. And I don't want to have anything to do with him. Keep an eye on that egg. All right, I'm watching it. How are you beating it? With a spoon, of course. Yes, yes, but which side of the spoon are you using? Oh, the back. Don't worry. He used not to be like this. Bergson has done for him. Oh, now he's trotting out that Bergson thing again. Yes, and why not? Do you know, Bonanzi, since I expounded to him Bergson's theory on intuition, he's been a completely different man. He used to be a powerful thinker. I've never been a thinker for your information. You see? Yeah, and I'm not allowed to say that Bergson has ruined him. Mark you, I agree with what you say about his views on reason. Well, if you agree, there's nothing more to be said. Beat that egg! I'm beating it! I'm beating it! But just listen a moment. According to Bergson, everything in reality that is fluid, living, mobile and indeterminate lies beyond the scope of reason. Though how it manages to escape reason, I don't know, seeing that Bergson is able to say it does. What makes him say so if it isn't his reason? And in that case, it seems to me it can't be beyond reason. What do you say? And what are you doing now? Right you are, I'm beating the egg. Look. You're not concentrating. All this talk about reason is taking your mind off what you're supposed to be doing. Oh, you're so impatient, my dear fellow. <laughs> I'm perfectly aware of the necessity of beating eggs. And as you can see, I accept and obey that necessity. But am I not allowed to use my mind for anything else? You really are wonderful, the pair of you. Oh, no, 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 you're wrong there. I'm wonderful if you like, but he for a long time now. Since he became corrupted by Bergson, in fact. No one has corrupted me if you don't mind. Yes, my dear chap. Uh You've become so deplorably human, I don't recognize you anymore. <laughs> Pirandello wrote Rules of the Game, from which that scene comes, in 1919, a time when all the certainties of life had been shattered by World War I. 19th century philosophical notions of an ordered, logical universe lay in ruins all over Europe. At the same time, his wife, who'd been ill, went into an asylum and it seems that private and public events conspired to release in him a sudden burst of creative energy. The main idea in Pirandello's theatre is that nothing is true, either in the theatre or in life. Human identity is unstable. We can't really communicate with each other because it's impossible for one person ever to know how another really thinks and feels. And we don't plan our lives, we simply improvise our way through them. So-called reality is in fact an illusion. Now, all of this is very theatrical. The philosophical paradoxes are those which any first-year undergraduate comes on, and though startling at first, we all soon learn to live with them. But the theatre is not really a place for ideas as such, and it's the way that Pirandello embodies them in dramatic characters and situations which makes him an original writer. But, like all writers, he doesn't come out of nowhere. He's an Italian, and he comes from the Commedia dell'arte and from the popular improvisational theatre of Italy of his day a theatre which can still be seen there in one form or another. It's full of huge characters with star parts and great comic turns, and everything is done with tremendous dizzying speed. But of course he wasn't just an Italian, he was a man of Europe and of his day. He knew about the futurists, he knew about the theatre of the grotesque, and all these elements somehow combined in him to produce what has become known as transcendental farce, more familiar to us perhaps as black farce, the kind of theatre which we associate with Ionesco and Harold Pinter. A comic writer can often get his audience to go further and deeper than they really want. He can con them along against their own natural distrust of seriousness. And what Pirandello does is to lure us into questioning the whole nature of theatre and theatrical illusion. Brecht did the same kind of thing a few years later. But Brecht wanted us to think. And Pirandello wanted to daze and dazzle us into feeling the same kind of horror that he felt of the pointlessness of human existence. Hmm. To me, it was never enough to present a man or a woman simply for the pleasure of presenting them, to tell a particular story simply for the pleasure of telling it, or to describe a landscape simply for the pleasure of describing it. Hmm. There are some writers who feel this pleasure and satisfied ask no more but they are what I would call historical writers. Now, there are others who, beyond such pleasure, feel a more profound spiritual need, and these are, more precisely, philosophical writers, and I have the misfortune to belong to these last. 
Hmm. How long do you think my speech should be tonight, Marta? Not too long. I don't want them to forget my performance. <laughs> they won't understand a word of what you're saying. My dear, they won't need to. Each man makes the best he can of his mask. His public mask, that is. For within each of us there is an inner mask which contradicts the outer one. Nothing is true. Oh yes, the sea, a mountain, a blade of grass, a rock, these things are true. But man, always wearing a mask, unwillingly, unwittingly, a mask of what he, in good faith, believes himself to be. But he invents so much and creates so many characters that he must believe in and take seriously. One night in June, I dropped down like a firefly beneath a huge pine tree standing all on its own in an olive grove on the edge of a blue clay plateau overlooking the African sea. We know about fireflies. It's as if the blackness exists solely for their benefit, so that they can show off their pale green gleam. Every now and then, one of them falls, and on the ground gives a sigh of green light, as if from very far away. That was how I dropped down on that June night, while so many other yellow fireflies twinkled on the hill, near a city cursed with the plague. Out of fear of the plague, my mother gave birth to me prematurely. Because so many people died every day that year, one single birth was regarded as a form of compensation and was considered all the more important, the more insignificant it actually was. I believe people will think it inevitable that I should have been born there rather than anywhere else and at that moment rather than any other. Although I must admit that I myself have no views on the matter. Senza la Sicilia Pirandello non si spiega. Io sono nato in un paese che è a 20 km dal luogo dove è nato Pirandello e ho cominciato a leggere Pirandello come uno scrittore della realtà, uno scrittore che nelle sue pagine mi dava l'immagine della vita come io la vedevo intorno a me. Insomma. Quindi tutto il problema filosofico che poi è stato innestato sull'opera di Pirandello a me non mi ha mai toccato, per me Pirandello è uno scrittore della realtà che vede la realtà in un certo modo. Di solito quando si, si fa il nome di Agrigento si pensa ai greci, ai tempi greci. Ecco, io credo che quello che c'è di diverso nella Sicilia sia dovuto ai due secoli di dominazione araba, ma la girgente degli arabi è sulla collina arroccata con quelle viuzze strette, con quei nomi delle sciade. Ed è ancora il problema idrico di Agrigento che non ha acqua. Ecco, questa è l'essenza della città, un'essenza araba. Ai tempi in cui Pirandello vi è nato era, era un paese piccolo in cui tutti si conoscevano, in cui c'erano delle case barocche in quelle viuzze che erano di topografia araba indubbiamente ed era una città piena di personaggi, di personaggi in cerca d'autore insomma, così come in un certo senso è ancora oggi, di persone che, che sono sull'orlo della follia senza mai entrarci però, che, che stanno proprio a contemplare se stesse 
in un gioco che direi folle, siciliane che sono gente di ingegno acuto e sospettoso, nata per le controversie. Pirandello le ha prese dalla realtà e le, le ha trasformate in fantasia. The theatre is a public trial of human actions as they really are, but it's set in that other reality, that eternal realm, which the poetic imagination creates as both an example and a warning for our confused everyday lives. The theatre is a public trial of human actions as they really are, but it is set in that other reality, that eternal realm which the poetic imagination has created as both an example and a warning for our confused everyday lives. It's a trial by a human audience which spurs on the consciences of the judges themselves to an even loftier and more rigorous moral life. Is that what you mean? Yes, very yeah. good, okay. exactly. If you could just go put your beard on, we'll do the appearance and see. Oh, lo spiritismo abbia una certa importanza nell'opera pirandelliana il suo gioco con la realtà dei personaggi che sono al tempo stesso personaggi reali e personaggi fantastici e questo è un gioco antico si può dire che risale a Cervantes e nel Don Quixote che comincia questo gioco del, per del personaggio che esce dalla realtà ed entra nella fantasia e poi rientra nella realtà i personaggi nella loro apparizione, nella loro sostanza, sono, sono spiriti. What author can say how and why a character is born in his imagination? Several years ago, my imagination had the unfortunate inspiration, or maybe it was just caprice, to bring a family into my house. I don't know where it fished them up from but apparently I should be able to find in them the subject for a magnificent novel. I could touch them and even hear them breathe when they were in my presence, each with his secret torment and all bound together by the one common origin and entanglement of their affairs, while I introduced them into the world of art, constructing from their persons, their passions and their adventures, a novel, a drama, or at least a story. We're looking for an author. An author? Which author? Any author will do so. I am not writing a new play. That's better still. Better still. We can be your new play. Will you please go away? I have not time to waste on idiots. You know very well, as a man of the theatre, that life is full of all sorts of odd things, which have no need at all to pretend to be real because they are actually true. Now, however much I tried, I couldn't find a meaning, anything of universal value in the characters. So I concluded that it was no use making them live and did all I could to forget them. Isn't it your job to give life on the stage to imaginary people? I suddenly saw a way out of my difficulty. Why not present this highly strange fact of an author who refuses to allow some of his characters to live, but once his imagination has given birth to them, they had refused to remain excluded from the world of art. In the desperate struggle for existence that they had waged with me, they had become dramatic characters who could move and talk on their own. So I thought, why not allow them to go where dramatic characters should go in order to exist, onto a stage? and let us see what will happen. I'll have you know that we have brought to life here on this stage many immortal works. There, you see? Good! You've given life! You've created living beings with more genuine life than people who breathe and wear clothes. Less real, perhaps, but nearer the truth. All right, all right, but where does all this get us? Nowhere. I want to try to show that one can be thrust into life in many ways, in many forms. As a tree, or a stone, as water, or a butterfly, or as a woman. It might even be as a character in a play. And you, 
all these other characters were thrust into life, as you put it, as characters in a play. Exactly. And alive, as you can see. <laughs> I'm sorry you laugh like that. Because we carry in us a story of terrible anguish. As you can guess from this woman dressed in black. Six Characters in Search of an Author is probably Pirandello's best-known play. As you can see, it's about a writer's relationship between his audience and his characters. The six characters who demand to have their story told are a father and stepdaughter locked in some terrible psychological conflict, a mother, son, and two other children. At some stage, the father left the mother because he thought she'd be happier with another man, and off she's gone and had three children by him. But now this other man's dead, and she's returned to her husband. But she's in a terrible state because she's found out that he and the stepdaughter had some kind of incestuous encounter in a brothel. Clearly, the family relationships have reached a pitch of quite intolerable stress. As a result, the story comes out in a series of incoherent fragments, which we, as the audience, are invited to put together. Pirandello makes us, in a sense, the author. Why did he decide to do this? Well, perhaps because the material was too personal. He felt he couldn't scale it down to a neat theatrical formula. He himself said the story was too melodramatic, but I'm not sure whether we need necessarily believe that. But taking the audience into his confidence, making a share in his creativity, might have been a way for him to conceal profound feelings, a terrible anguish like that of which the father speaks. Fragmentation of material, questioning a writer's motives about human relationships and how he deals with these, playing with theatrical conventions, all this makes Pirandello a very modern writer. But six characters is not a stylistic exercise. Although it has a tricksy surface, there is real feeling beneath. Right, quiet please, let's listen to them. Quiet. Yes, listen to his little scrap of philosophy. He's gonna tell you all about the demon of experiment. You're a cynical idiot, and I've told you so a hundred times. He sneers at me because of this expression I found to defend myself. Words, words. Yes, words, words! When we're faced by something we don't understand, by a sense of evil that seems as if it's going to swallow us, don't we all find comfort in a word that tells us nothing, but that calms us? And dulls your sense of remorse, too. That more than anything. No! Remorse? That's not true. It'll take more than words to dull the sense of remorse in me. Oh, it's taken a little money, too. Just a little money. The money that he was going to offer as payment, gentlemen! That's a filthy trick. Shame on you, daughter! Shame! Shame? No, not shame. Revenge. Oh, I'm desperate. Desperate to live that scene. The room. Over there. A showcase of coins. There. The divan. There, the mirror. There, the screen. And over there, under the window, is the little mahogany table with the pale blue envelope and the money in it. I can see it all quite clearly. I could... But you should turn your face away, gentlemen, because I'm nearly naked. <laughs> I'm not blushing anymore. I leave that to him. But he was very pale then, very pale. Believe me. I don't understand anymore. I'm not surprised when you're attacked like that. Why don't you put your foot down and let me have my say before you believe all these horrible slanders she's so viciously telling about We don't me. want to hear any more of your long-winded fairy stories. I'm not going to tell any fairy stories. I want to explain things to him. Oh, yes, I'm sure you do, in your own special way. <sighs> but isn't that the cause of all the trouble? Words? We all have a world of things inside ourselves. And each one of us has his own private world. How can we understand each other if the words I use have a sense and value that I expect them to have? But whoever is listening to me 
thinks I have a different sense and value because of the private world he has inside himself too. We think we understand each other, but we never do. Look, all my pity, all my compassion for this woman. She sees his ferocious cruelty. But he turned me out of the house. There, do you hear? I turned her out. Do you really believe that I have turned her out? You know how to talk. I don't. But believe me, sir, after he married me, I can't think why. I was a poor, simple woman. But that was a reason. I married you for your simplicity. That's what I loved in you, believing. No. Do you see? She says no. It's terrifying, sir. Believe me, terrifying. Her deafness. Her mental deafness. Affection for her children. Oh, yes. But deaf. Mentally deaf. Deaf, sir, to the point of desperation. Oh, yes. But make him tell you what good all his cleverness has brought us. If only we could see in advance all the harm that can come from the good we think we are doing. And gradually, that universal meaning which at first I had vainly sought in the characters came out of its own accord in the excitement of their struggles with each other and the producer who does not understand them. Without wanting to and without knowing it, their passion and torment expressed the passion and torment that for so many years had plagued me. The deceit involved in understanding one another. The multiple personality that everybody possesses. And finally, the tragic conflict between life, which is always moving and changing, and form, which fixes it immutable. Quando si pensa al teatro di Pirandello, viene in mente un racconto, una inquisizione di, di Borges che racconta di quando Averroè, il filosofo arabo, traduceva la poetica d'Aristotele. Arrivato alla, alle parole commedia e tragedia, Averroè non sapeva tradurle perché non aveva idea del teatro, non aveva idea di che cosa fossero commedia e tragedia. E poi uscendo e vedendo giochi dei ragazzi, eh, cose, discorsi di donne, eccetera, ha un'intuizione di quel che può essere il teatro. Ora Pirandello è un po' così. come se il teatro non lo avesse conosciuto prima e se lo fosse inventato. Pirandello ha inventato il teatro come uno dell'Islam, insomma. Questo è come se avesse colto il teatro nel flusso indistinto della vita. I personaggi sono e non sono, c'è tutto un gioco di apparenze e di realtà. At the moment. We are here on our own and the public doesn't know about us. But tomorrow you will present us in whatever way you choose, I suppose. But wouldn't you like to see it explode into life as it really is? Yes, of course, of course. There's nothing I'd like more than I can use as much of it as possible. Then persuade my mother to leave. No! No, don't do it! Don't let her do But it! But they're only doing it for me to watch, only for me to see. I can't bear it! I can't bear it! But if it's happened already, I can't see the objection. No! It's happening now as well! It's happening all the time! I'm not acting my suffering, can't you understand that? I'm alive here and now, but I can never forget that terrible moment of agony that repeats itself endlessly and vividly in my mind. <laughs> For any character, his drama is his very raison d'etre. But the mother doesn't even realize that she is alive. She hasn't the slightest suspicion that she is not alive. She is so incapable of stepping outside her role that she doesn't even realize that she has a role. It's as if she is pure nature, fixed in the figure of a mother. The pain that she feels is life itself, which in order to exist has become fixed in our bodies and little by little kills them. The father and the stepdaughter are tortured in the same way, but for them it is a mental torment. For the mother, it is natural. 
the mind rebels and fights in order to try and gain something from the situation. Nature weeps. So there you are. I say, old man, who is mad, you or me? <laughs> of course, I understand. I say it's you, and you say it's me. You, you are mad, no? It's me? Oh, very well, it's me. Have it your own way. Between you and me, we get along very well, don't we? But the trouble is that other people don't think of you as I do. And that being the case, old man, what a fix you're in. As for me, I say that here, right here and now, right in front of you, I can see myself with my own eyes, touch myself with my finger. But what are you for other people? What are you in their eyes? An image. Just an image in a glass. They're all carrying just such a phantom and round inside themselves. And they're all racking their brains about the phantoms in other people. And they think all that is quite all right. The butler enters, in time to catch Loud Easy gesticulating at himself in the glass. He wonders if the man is crazy. Finally, he speaks up. <clears throat> Signor Loud Easy, if you please, two ladies calling, sir. And of course you said that everyone was out. I said that you were in. Why, not at all. I'm miles and miles away. Perhaps the fellow they call Loud Easy is here. I don't understand, sir. Why, you think the Loud Easy they know is the Loud Easy I am? <laughs> I don't understand, sir. Who are you talking to? Who am I talking to? I thought I was talking to you. Are you really sure the loud easy you are talking to is the loud easy the ladies want to see? Well, I think so, sir. They said they were looking for the brother of Signora Agazzi. Ah, in that case, you are right. You are not the brother of Signor Agazzi. No, it's me. Right you are. Tell them I'm in and please show them up, will you? Very good. But we're both in the first act of Henry IV. It's time we changed. Yes? Curtain up in half an hour. Have you seen Mr. Pirandello? Which, Which Mr. Mr. Pirandello? Pirandello. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just not possible to really live in front of a looking glass. You try looking into the mirror while you're crying about what really grieves you most. Hmm? Or while you're laughing, because you're wonderfully happy. <laughs> See? Your tears and laughter will stop abruptly. As a young man, Pirandello had left Sicily to study in Bonn, then settled in Rome. But he frequently returned to his prosperous petit bourgeois family in Agrigento. In accordance with Sicilian custom, he entered an arranged marriage with Antonietta Portulano, the daughter of his father's business partner. Although he took her to live with him in Rome, where Pirandello achieved some success as a short story writer and novelist, their income still came mainly from the family sulphur mine. La Zolfaera ha avuto grande importanza nella vita di Pirandello per un fatto economico, familiare, sociale e anche sentimentale, direi. Goethe, quando passa per l'altipiano, che poi è diventato l'altipiano zolfifero, nota delle messi verdeggianti, dei terreni lavorati con grande cura, con grande pulizia, 50 anni dopo non era più la stessa cosa. Quel paesaggio era diventato arido, secco, bruciato proprio dal fiato dello, dello zolfo in combustione. Le condizioni di vita della zolfara erano allora terribili. Gli operai partivano la mattina all'alba a piedi facevano parecchi chilometri 
prima di arrivare alla Zolfara, poi una volta la Zolfara scendevano a parecchi centinaia di metri sottoterra, dove il caldo era soffocante, lavoravano muri e non c'era granché di sicurezza nella Zolfara. Le disgrazie, cioè gli incidenti, i disastri, succedevano sempre e spesso con operai morti. E gli esercenti, cioè coloro che gestivano il Zolfare, si arricchivano. E il padre di Pirandello era un imprenditore. Aveva una Zolfara in territorio d'Aragona che ad un certo punto si allagò. E fu la rovina per la famiglia di Pirandello perché ingoiò anche la dote della moglie di Pirandello e qui la moglie che era in effetti legata alla sua dote, cioè la sua dote, il suo denaro costituiva una specie di, di identità, di forza. Da, da questo tracollo ebbe un colpo, venne la malattia nervosa, la follia, insomma. Quindi la Zofare ebbe una grande incidenza sulla vita di Pirandello. From 1903 to 1919, Pirandello and the three children lived in Rome, in the claustrophobic world of his wife's irrational jealousy and worsening paranoia. Dove sei stata tutta la giornata? Che le ragazze di Come? He was obviously two people, one for himself, another for her. And this other person she saw in him, this sad phantom, whose every look, smile, gesture, the very sound of whose voice, the sense of whose words were transformed in her own mind, this other man came to life and lived for her, while he himself no longer existed. In 1919, Pirandello reluctantly had his wife committed to an asylum. Once she had left, My house suddenly seemed empty. She was my nightmare. But she filled the house with her presence. When I was alone, I wandered about like a lost soul in those rooms. I feel that my life is devoid of meaning. And I no longer see any reason in the acts I perform or in the words I say. And it astonishes me that other people can move about outside this nightmare of mine, that they can act and speak. The experience of the previous 15 years had confirmed Pirandello's vision of the world. The emotional turmoil caused by Antonietta's committal released in him the burst of creative energy in which he wrote many of his most famous plays. He also reworked his 1904 essay on humor, which contains all the ideas he subsequently used in his theater. Humor is far more complex than comedy. And take Don Quixote, for example. You see, you want to laugh at the comedy and the character of this poor deranged man who involves everybody and everything in the disguise of his madness. But the laughter is not natural and easy. And what hampers it is a feeling of pity or sadness or even of admiration because however ludicrous the poor chap's adventures are truly heroic yes maestro the curtain's going up in quarter of an hour and carlo still doesn't think his voice is up to it oh england and this is june <laughs> <laughs> have you finished learning his lines yes then you must go on But I still don't see why that makes you a humorous writer rather than a comic one. Look, if I see an old lady with dyed hair, horrible lotion smeared all over, hmm? badly made up, kitted out like a young girl, then I begin to laugh because she is the exact opposite of what a respectable old lady should be. Now, I could stop here at this superficial comic reaction, but I might perhaps reflect that this old lady isn't happy being dressed up as an exotic parrot. Perhaps she is distressed by it. And maybe the poor thing does it in order to hold on to a, a much younger husband. 
Now I can no longer laugh the way I did before. And that is the precise difference between comedy and humour. Well, that's absolutely right. That's wonderful. Why don't you put that in your uh, speech tonight? No, 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 no. I put that in an essay 20 years ago. No, what they want to know is why I made that, uh, that declaration of support to Mussolini last year. Well, he helped to fund this company, didn't he? Yes, that's true, he did. But I, you see, I, I really do admire him. I am, in fact, not political at all. But I think Mussolini gives Italy a sense of reality. I don't understand you at all. Now you're a fascist. Once you were an anarchist, an individualist, a socialist. No, never a socialist. I am a Sicilian. I can remember what the Sicilian peasants and sulfur workers are like. How could they possibly believe in a class struggle in those conditions? In ogni popolo si possono trovare delle contraddizioni. Nei nei siciliani forse sono più più pronunciate, più più ricche in un certo senso. E anche, anche Pirandello è un po' dentro questa contraddizione, insomma. Pirandello non condivide le istanze sociali che si muovono nei fasci siciliani, però la sua pietà per coloro che zo- lavorano nel mondo della zolfara è grande. Ecco, bisogna distinguere tra l'ideologia e la pietà in Pirandello. Lui arriva al fascismo per l'antiparlamentarismo. Non ha non ha stima del Parlamento, ritiene che il Parlamento rappresenta una democrazia fittizia e non sostanziale, per cui quando si si annuncia il fascismo che che sopprime il Parlamento e instaura una dittatura, eh, Pirandello ritiene che lì stia la salvezza dell'Italia. Ma la sua opera non si può dire di destra, ecco. La sua è un'opera rivoluzionaria, mentre il comportamento della sua vita è stato quello di un uomo piuttosto appoggiato alla reazione che alla rivoluzione. Pirandello è uno che è nato ed è vissuto per scrivere. Veramente quando lui dice la vita o la si vive o la si scrive, dice una cosa assolutamente vera. Lui ha accettato la vita per scriverla e non per viverla. A man lives, he lives and does not see himself in the act of living. Either he is astonished at his own appearance, or else he turns away his eyes so as not to see himself, or else in disgust he spits at his image or again clenches his fist to break it. In a word, there arises a crisis, and that crisis is my theater. Like six characters in search of an author, Henry IV is about real and imaginary worlds, truth and fiction, madness and sanity. The hero, by the way, has nothing to do with Shakespeare's English king. He's an 11th century Holy Roman Emperor. Twenty years before the play begins, a group of young aristocrats have put on a historical cavalcade, and our chief character has gone as Henry IV. The woman he loves has gone as the Marchesa Matilda of Tuscany. During the procession, Henry falls from his horse, bangs his head, and wakes up believing he actually is the emperor. His family decide to humor this delusion, and being rich, provide him with a medieval castle and servants disguised as medieval courtiers. Madness fascinated Pirandello. He believed we all contain every possibility within us. We can all become thieves or lunatics at any moment. And it's an idea which has entered powerfully into modern literature. Whereas most of us assume we live in a more or less ordered rational universe, Pirandello denied it. There was no principle of reason for him, no God, no meaning in life at all. It was all just a farce. And because the mad, by being mad, are freed from the illusions of purpose and rationality, they are closer to reality than we are. At some point before the play begins, Henry IV has in fact recovered his sanity. But he shares Pirandello's views and it gives him a great sense of power and superiority to go on pretending to be mad, when in fact, he believes, he sees the world more clearly than the so-called sane. 
Now, however, a group of old friends, including Matilda and a doctor, have heard he's improving and are coming to see him. In the second act, he decides to let his retainers in on his secret. I'm not mad anymore. Oh, no. Can't you see me? We laugh behind the backs of those who think I am. Now, you're called... Ah, wait a moment. Momo. That's right. Momo. Well, how splendid everything is, eh? But then... Oh, God. Then nothing! And let's all have a good, long, enormous laugh! laugh! <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? Look me straight in the eyes. I'm not saying it's true. Don't worry. Nothing is true. Look me in the eyes. All right. Well, then? You see it. You see yourself. There's fear in your eyes now, too, because I'm acting like a madman. That's the proof. That's the proof. What proof? Your dismay when you think I'm mad again. And yet, by God, you know I'm mad. You believe it. You believed it right up until this very moment. Yes or no? You see, you feel your dismay turn to terror, like something making the ground give way beneath your feet, taking away the very air you breathe. Of course, gentlemen, you know what it's like to be with a madman, to be with someone who shakes the foundations, the logic of the whole structure of everything you've built in and around yourselves. So what do you expect? Madmen, and good for them, do build without logic or with their own feather-brained logic. They're unstable, they're inconstant. Today one way, tomorrow God knows how. You stick to things they don't. Instability. Inconstancy. You say, this can't be so, but for them, anything can be. That's not true, you say. And why? Because it's not true for you, and you, and you, and a hundred thousand others. Oh, my dear fellows, then we'd better find out what sort of thing is true to these hundred thousand who aren't mad, and what sort of a show they can put on with their unanimous agreement and their exquisite logic. When I was a child, I thought the moon in the puddle was the real thing. So many things seemed true. I believed everything I was told and I was happy because... Look out! Look out! You must cling fiercely to what seems true to you today and to what will seem true to you tomorrow, even if it's the opposite of what seemed true yesterday. Take care that you don't sink without trace like me trying to grasp this awful fact which really does drive one mad. That you can be standing beside someone, looking them in the eyes, as I was looking a certain person in the eye one day. And you can see you're a beggar at a gate through which you'll never enter. Whoever does go through it won't be you. Ever. You with the world inside your head, the world you can see and touch. But someone you don't even know. Seeing and touching you in his own impenetrable world. It's dark in here. Would you like me to go and get the lamp? The lamp? Do you think I don't realize you turn on the electric light? Every time I turn my back and take my lamp to bed, here and in the throne room. Of course, I pretend not to see it. Oh. Then would you like me to... No, it would dazzle me. I'd rather have my lamp. It's here, ready, behind the door. How am I doing? Pirandello isn't a symbolist. He belongs to no dramatic school at all. But Henry's lamp is, in a sense, the light of the individual consciousness in a dark and chaotic world. All Pirandello's main characters tend to retreat from an intolerable reality into private worlds. And here, he's very much a writer of his time, responding to the moral and philosophical vacuum left by the First World War. Henry IV, at the end of the play, 
deliberately makes it impossible for himself ever to escape from his castle. He chooses the real world of madness over the mad world of reality. He's freer in so-called madness to be himself, or so he thinks. The questions Pirandello asks are all unanswerable. Indeed, we're not really allowed by modern philosophy to ask them, though we all want to. What is the meaning of life? What is truth? How do we know anything for certain in a world whose governing principle seems to be relativity? All Pirandello can offer is the loneliness of the individual, the fragility of human personality, the impossibility of certainty. It's a bleak vision, leaving us giddy on the abyss with no religious or philosophical comfort. But it's expressed through thrilling theatrical images, which make us feel, at least for a time, that we understand our dilemmas clearer than before. Pirandello's transcendental farce has been enormously influential. It's the beginning of 20th century tragedy. Cured? Oh yes, I'm cured. But not so it can be ended as easily as that. Do you realize that in 20 years no one has dared to appear before me dressed like you and that man there? All right. Let's drop my disguise too. <laughs> if I'm to come away with you. With me? With us? Yes. Where shall we go? To the club in white tie and tails or to the Marquesa's house. The two of us, arm in arm. <laughs> Wherever you like. You surely don't want to stay here all by yourself, going on with an unhappy carnival joke. It's incredible, really incredible. You could have gone on with it at all once your illness was over. Yes, but you must realize, falling off my horse and banging my head, I really did go mad. For I don't know how long. I see. I see, but it was for a long time. Oh, yes, doctor, a long time. It's a very interesting case. You must study me. Study me closely. One day, I don't know how, but the damage here, I don't know. It got better. Little by little, I opened my eyes again. At first, I couldn't be sure if I was asleep or awake. And then, yes, I was awake. I touched this, then that, and yes, I could see clearly. Oh, as this man says, let's drop the disguise, the nightmare. Let's open the windows and breathe life again. Come on, let's go. Let's run outside. But to go where? And to do what? This sense we have of life is like a lantern which each of us carries within himself. Now this lantern, with its faint light, reveals to us that we are lost, astray on the face of the earth, showing us the good and the evil on every hand. Why not? Our lanterns cast about us a greater or lesser area of light beyond which all is blank darkness. Now, this fearful gloom would not exist were our lanterns not there to make us conscious of it, though we must believe it is a real darkness so long as our lights are aglow within us. Well now, imagine that our lamps are blown out. This fictitious darkness will engulf us entirely, will it not? After our cloudy day of illusion, perpetual night. But is it really perpetual night? Or is it simply that we have fallen into the arms of essence, which has broken down the insubstantial form of our reason? been considered a pessimist. Well, perhaps my words do reveal a, an anti-traditional mentality, but I have been misunderstood. My art 
is free of that pessimism which causes a lack of faith in my life. And I am not even a nihilist, since in the spiritual activity which torments me and which animates my work, there is an incessant desire to create. I feel a sense of joy in creating the ground beneath the feet of my characters. Perandello's attempt to create an Italian national theatre ran into financial difficulties, and the Arts Theatre was to close in 1928. He lost his interest in Mussolini, and his work fell out of favour in Italy. For the next six years, he travelled to various cities in Europe and America, until 1934, when he won the Nobel Prize for Literature and returned to Rome, where he died in 1936. In his last years, he continued to write plays, increasingly as vehicles for Marta Abba, the young actress whose career he'd encouraged and who'd caused a sensation in many of his plays. Whoever understands the game of life can no longer fool himself. But if you cannot fool yourself, you can no longer derive any pleasure or enjoyment from life. And so it goes. My art is full of compassion. Bitter compassion for all those who fool themselves. But this compassion cannot help but be followed by ferocious derision of a destiny that condemns man to deception. And this succinctly is the reason for the bitterness of my art and also my life. The taste of life, the taste for life, that is never satisfied, that never can be satisfied. Because life, even as we're in the very act of living it, is so ravenously hungering after itself that it never lets itself be fully tasted. The taste for life comes to us from the past, from the memories that hold us bound. But bound to what? To this folly of ours, to this mass of vexations, to so many stupid illusions, to so many insipid occupations. <laughs>